So let me, and this is going to be primarily a slideshow of uh, things I've seen on some of these trips. So I'm going to uh, discuss uh, six different uh, telescope sites I've been to, uh, some reasonably nearby, which is a Dearborn telescope, which is not in Dearborn, Michigan. And let's see, the most distant one is uh, the Allen Telescope Array out of California. And I'll also describe a trip up to the North Pole. So on a number of the trips I've taken to see telescopes, I've had three people that have come along with me, my traveling companions, and they are, um, get off my pointer here, <clears throat> Dr. Ismar Centora, a retired vascular surgeon from Phoenix, and Ellen and Oyvind from Oslo, Norway. Uh, we met up in Mauna Kea when we were there to see the Keck telescope, and we've uh, traveled quite a bit since together. So uh, let me start with the Dearborn Telescope. This is actually located in uh, Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, just north of Chicago. Uh, the telescope was originally ordered by the president of the University of Mississippi back in 1860. It was ordered from Alvin Clark and Sons, who were uh, quite famous opticians and made uh, excellent telescope lenses. And this was, uh, for a while, the largest refractor in the world, a refractor being a telescope with a lens rather than a mirror. In this case, it was 18 and a half inches in diameter. And it didn't keep that title very long, only for about six years. Unfortunately, uh, between the time the telescope was ordered in 1860 and when it was completed, the Civil War broke out, and it became impossible to ship a telescope from Massachusetts down to Mississippi, and eventually it ended up in Chicago. Uh, something of interest is back in 1862, with this telescope, they discovered uh, Sirius B, the companion star for Sirius A, which is the brightest star in our sky. In case you're not aware, uh, Sirius B is a white dwarf star. These are little tiny stars about the size of the Earth, but may have even more mass than our own sun. So today it's not used in research, it's used uh, for teaching purposes. But they also have public shows there, and every Friday night from 8 till 10. So if you're in Chicago on a Friday evening, this is something worthwhile going to see. So this is the observatory building. Uh, the dome up here is a little hard to see because it's the same color as the sky. But this is a time exposure at night, and you can see the dome clearly and the uh, path of the stars due to the Earth's rotation during the exposure. So this is the telescope. Uh, <clears throat> the lens, 18 and a half inches is up at this end. Eyepiece is down at the other end. Okay, so let me uh, move on to my second telescope. This is at the Yerkes Observatory, which is about a two-hour drive north of Chicago with an easy driving uh, time of Detroit, owned and operated by the University of Chicago. The observatory was established back in 1897. Again, the optics, the lens, was uh, produced by Alvin Clark and Sons. It is currently the largest refractor in the world. So the lens is uh, 40 inches in diameter or one meter. And they do have free public tours there every Saturday morning or you can go other days as well, but then you have to pay a little bit for a tour. So this is the observatory as seen from the air. Uh, the large dome here is where they have the large uh, refractor, and they have two smaller domes for smaller telescopes. So this is um, the large dome as seen from the ground, uh, quite, quite intricate in detail in architecture. And so we're just waiting here Saturday morning to get in with, with uh, some other people for the free tour. Another view of the large dome seen from the back of the observatory. And this is the telescope. So again, the 40-inch lens is up at this end. Eyepieces are down here. 
view of the pedestal on, on which the telescope is mounted. So it looks like they've taken uh, stairs out of a lighthouse uh, to get from the floor up to where the, the axes are. So this is the equatorial mount, so there are two axes. There's the polar axis, which is this one, which is aligned with the Earth's axis of rotation. So it's pointing up towards the North Star Polaris. And then there's the other axis perpendicular for rotating the telescope north and south in the sky. And here are my three traveling companions on the rainy day that we were there visiting the telescope. So we did the free tour, and then we got an additional private tour for a couple hours for a $100 cost, but, but it was well worth it. Jerry? Yes. I mentioned that, that the Yerkes was formed by, by George Allery Hale. Uh, <clears throat> he <clears throat> got, got the money together, I guess. Got the money together and, and was inspiring. <clears throat> yeah, 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 inspired the construction and obtained funding for the telescope. <laughs> okay, well, Pluto, the dwarf planet of Pluto has been in the news quite a bit recently because of the, the flyby of New Horizons. So I thought I'd take a quick look at the two observatories where Pluto and its moon were discovered. Well, first of all, going out to the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, this is a little bit higher elevation. This is about uh, a little more than 7,000 feet above sea level. So the observatory itself was uh, founded back in 1894 by Percival Lowell. Again, <clears throat> this is a refracting telescope, 24 inches in diameter, again produced by Alvin Clark. Uh, and he used it for <laughs> studying what he thought were the canals of Mars for many, many years, for decades. And as we know nowadays, um, this turned out to be a fantasy optical illusions, there were no canals, which he was observing, but uh, he thought he was. A real discovery was made by Clyde Tombaugh back in 1930 using a 13-inch refractor when he discovered uh, what we now call the dwarf planet Pluto. So <clears throat> this is one of the gates into the observatory grounds, and within the grounds, along one of the sidewalks, they have a scale model of our solar system. So here's the Sun, Mercury, uh, Earth in here, Mars, and then further out, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and so forth. At the end of the sidewalk, where you'd expect to see a sign for Pluto, in fact, there's a small observatory building, which, which is right there. This is what that observatory building looks like. <laughs> and if you go inside, you see the telescope, the 13-inch refractor, that was uh, used in the discovery of Pluto. So uh, there's a photographic plate which uh, sits down here, 14 by 17 inches. Uh, view from the other side of the same telescope. And if you're wondering what this boxing glove is doing up here, occasionally visitors would hit their head on this steel rod. <laughs> and so to, to cushion the, bl the, the blow, uh, they put this nice soft padded boxing glove. So of interest is to look at the photographic plates in which Pluto was discovered. Uh, it wasn't easy, so if you look carefully, the arrow points at a little, little dot, that was Pluto. This was on January 23rd. Six days later, on the 29th of January, that little dot had moved from there over to this point here. You can hardly see it in this photograph. It moved from here up to about there. So the six days that it traveled that far across the sky. And uh, that was Pluto, and uh, these are the discovery plates. Uh, the telescope was a knockout. The telescope was a knockout. <laughs> yes, it was. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> okay, U.S. Naval Observatory uh, in Flagstaff. So this is about five miles to the west of, of uh, the first observatory we were at. Um, it was established back in 1955 for the U.S. Naval Observatory. <coughs> it is their dark sky site for optical and infrared measurements. Uh, they got three, or actually four main instruments there. But let's just look at the larger one, which is a 1.55 meter uh, the strand uh, reflector. Well, this is now using a mirror instead of a lens uh, for the focusing. 
And that telescope is of interest because uh, Pluto's moon was discovered uh, there back in 1978. Pluto's moon, and I still don't know the correct pronunciation, because I've heard there, lots of variety. There isn't any. Okay, that's probably right. I hear Sh Charon, Charon, Sharon, Charon, Karen. Anybody think he knows <laughs> the correct pronunciation? Actually, Sharon. Sharon. Okay, Ken says it's Sharon. Francette, does that sound right to you? Oh, I use all six of them when I You use all six. Yeah. Oh, okay, very good. <laughs> Sharon was the guy. Okay, so this is uh, the observatory, uh, U.S. Naval Observatory in Flagstaff. You can tell that it's a naval observatory. You can look carefully. There's a ship's anchor, which is uh, sitting right here. Hold it to the ground. <laughs> Um, so the large eye reflector is in this um, observatory structure. Also note that there's a, a walk rail which goes around at this point. And I'll show you a couple pictures uh, from that rail in a second. So this is uh, the view of the telescope. So the, the mirror itself, the reflecting mirror, is down here. Incoming light is reflected up to a secondary mirror. Goes back down through a hole in the primary to cameras and, <laughs> and detectors and spectrometers and so forth down in this vicinity. Okay, so now we're standing on the rail. This is the astronomer who gave us uh, about an hour and a half tour of the facility. And this is uh, my friend Ismar. And we're looking out across the countryside. And here we're looking towards the north. These, uh, if you've been in the Flagstaff area, these are the San Francisco peaks, the highest of which is uh, Humphreys Peak, which is either this one or maybe that one back there, which is the highest uh, mountain in Arizona, 12,633 feet above sea level. So this is the discovery photo of Sharon. Um, when looking carefully at Pluto, sometimes you get a nice, reasonably round image. And other times, a um, little bump appeared on the side, which would reappear periodically. Um, and this turns out to be the moon, Sharon. The telescope did not have the resolving power to separate the two bump, uh, objects. But the Hubble Space Telescope can do it easily. So here's Pluto, and here's um, Sharon, seen from the Hubble. Now a new horizon went by, we got a very much better view. So this is uh, Pluto. And an up close view of some of the ice mountains there, which are maybe three, 4,000 meters in height. And the moon share, uh, <clears throat> color enhanced somewhat in that picture. Okay, let's go out to California to the Allen Telescope Array. This was a... Um, <clears throat> Built back, um, well, it was built by the University of California in Berkeley, and the SETI Institute, SETI being the acronym for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, so it was actually built in 2007. And it indicated it was in a radio quiet valley, about 300 miles uh, northeast of San Francisco. Uh, it's called the Allen Telescope Array because Paul Allen, one of the co-founders of Microsoft, uh, donated more than $30 million uh, to build it. Today it consists of 42 dishes, radial reflectors, 6 meters in diameter, <clears throat> so about 20 feet, and they can be used individually or they can be uh, connected together and used uh, collectively, uh, spread out over a baseline of about 300 meters. So the operating frequencies are indicated here. If you prefer wavelengths, um, the wavelengths, this is in the microwave band, go from about 60 centimeters down to about 2.7 centimeters. It was used for both doing <clears throat> traditional radio astronomy as well as searches for extraterrestrial intelligence. Oops, wrong button. 
So here we're driving onto the observatory ground, uh, a lot of uh, pine trees in the area. And the, the uh, array is actually located at Hat Creek Radial Observatory. And as indicated, it's open to visitors. You can do a self-guided tour there. So here are some of those dishes. <coughs> Close up. So there are 42 total of these dishes. So uh, we have a couple warnings here. And you should be careful because the antennas can move without warning. And they have uh, warnings about not parking your car too close to them. Also, there are rattlesnakes in the area. So one needs to keep an outlook for them. Picture of Ismar getting a picture of the dishes. So the way it works, it's kind of a funny looking uh, arrangement, is it is looking in this direction. The incoming microwaves hit the primary parabolic dish and reflected down to a secondary dish, which is then reflected down to a cryogenically cooled set of uh, <clears throat> uh, radio receivers or antenna which are located in this position. Oops. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the cryogenically cool portion is what you see here. And they have these individual elements which go from quite long down to quite short, span the range of frequencies over which this is sensitive. And inside the control room, uh, one sees this behind the relay racks. <coughs> and this, there are fiber optic cables which come from each of the dishes individually. And then the cables uh, go into banks of computers here, which then process the data and can use them either collectively or individually. say a little bit about the SETI Institute because we visited that on the same trip that we saw the Allen Telescope Array. This is located in Mountain View, very close to San Jose, right in the heart of Silicon Valley. So the SETI Institute is indicated as a nonprofit organization and they are interested in understanding the origin and the prevalence of life in the universe. It was incorporated back in 1984 the CEO and Dr. Jill Tarter, and <clears throat> includes in part the Carl Sagan uh, Center for the Study of Life in the Universe. Uh, <clears throat> the studies conducted there make use of the Allen Telescope Array, several other ground-based telescopes, space telescopes, and the Martian uh, rover. And some of the more prominent people that are associated with it are again Jill Tarter, uh, Frank Drake, who <clears throat> is well known uh, in terms of his work uh, in SETI searches. Uh, he's, been, he's responsible for the Drake equation. If you are familiar with that, just <clears throat> give you the equation, giving you the number of intelligent civilizations in our galaxy today in terms of a product of a number of factors, most of which are not very well known. Carl Sagan, Paul Allen, a couple Nobel laureates associated with it. Those of you who have seen the movie Contact, uh, which starred Jodie Foster, she portrayed the fictional character uh, Ellie Arroway, <coughs> and that character was based on the life and career of Jill Tarter, uh, who, who served as an advisor for that movie. Well, uh, Ismar and I met Jill Tarter in the Canary Islands uh, while we were there for an event and to see some telescopes there. And so I contacted her and she made arrangements for us to get a private tour through their headquarters building. So this is um, the entrance to the building, the SETI Institute. This is the building. This is a picture of me taking a picture of myself <laughs> using the window by the front door. So inside, uh, the Carl Sagan Center. Very interesting, the most interesting part was the office of Jill Tarter. Uh, she wasn't there that day, but, but we, we got a tour through her office. Um, there are a lot of interesting plaques 
certificates and citations that she has received over the years for her work. For example, you probably can't read it, but this is one, uh, Time, Time Magazine. And in one year, she was listed among the 100 most prominent people in the world. And here's a citation from NASA for her work and a bunch of other ones. And <clears throat> there's a picture <clears throat> of Joe. Uh, Frank Drake has an office there. <clears throat> he wasn't in either. Uh, we attended a one-hour colloquium while we were there, uh, which looked at uh, clay minerals on both uh, the early Earth and Mars. This was given by somebody from NASA, Ames, which is located just a few blocks from the SETI Institute. And we got our picture taken as we were leaving the building there. Okay, let's go to the Apache Point Observatory. Uh, this is in New Mexico. It's uh, more than 9,000 feet above mean sea level. It's located uh, in Sunspot, 40 miles from Alamogordo. Uh, they've got uh, four major telescopes there, ranging in size from 3.5 meters down to half a meter. The 2.5 meter telescope has been used uh, at about 2,000 for carrying out what is called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This has given us the most precise, the most comprehensive three-dimensional view of our universe to date. And it's still an ongoing project. Uh, the larger telescope, the three and a half meter telescope, is used for Project Apollo. This is a project to uh, measure the distance to the moon, bouncing laser pulses off of reflecting mirrors on the moon. So Apollo is an acronym, Apache Point Observatory, Lunar Laser Ranging Operation. So they use uh, pulses of light, which are one-tenth of a nanosecond in duration, which makes them one inch long. They fire 20 pulses per second at the moon. Each uh, pulse has about 300 quadrillion photons, or if you like scientific notation, that's about 3 times 10 to the 17th photon. And they bounce the uh, beams from four different uh, mirrors on the moon, and uh, actually five mirrors, that were left by the Apollo astronauts on Apollo 11, 14, and 15, and there are also two additional mirrors on two of the Soviet lunar rovers. So these are retro-reflecting mirrors that bounce the pulse of light straight back to the source, right back to the same telescope. So they send out three times 10 to the 17 photons, on average, they get back about one photon per pulse. But that's enough to carry out the measurements, and they're able to measure, the claim is now, they can measure the distance between the center of mass of the moon, center of mass to the Earth, to an accuracy of one millimeter, the width of a paper clip. The reason they're doing this is they want to compare predictions from Einstein's general theory of relativity and see if those predictions are in agreement with the motions of the moon relative to the Earth. Okay, so here we're driving up to Sunspot, where the, where the Apache Point Observatory is. Uh, we're on Highway 82, driving east. If you look back to the west, you can see a white band here. That is White Sands uh, Missile Range and also White Sands National Monument. So we come up Highway 82 at Cloudcroft, right here. We go south on Highway, what is it, 65, 63. Um, they've laid out another scale model of the solar system here, with uh, Pluto going through uh, Cloudcroft, and then we have the orbits of Neptune, Uranus, and so forth. So as you're driving toward the observatory, there's a bunch of signs. This is where Newt, Neptune would be on that scale. Jupiter and the other ones. And then we get down, this is the turn off to the Apache Point Observatory. And now we're there. They have a self guided tour that one can go on. And uh, here's the information box for the tour. We had made arrangements ahead of time, and we had two astronomers that spent about uh, three hours with us uh, showing us interesting things. So this is the housing for the 2.5 meter telescope with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was made. And 
this is the structure right here. So the telescope stays fixed, and this structure uh, rolls on a track. And so it's out of the way, and this is the actual telescope itself, with two astronomers there for scale. This is one of the astronomers, and she's showing us something very interesting. This is an aluminum disc, which has approximately a thousand holes which have been drilled through it. And here's a little closer view. This represents the images of about a thousand objects which they want to study on a particular night. So each of the holes and the little circle drawn around them is the location of an object of which they want to take the spectrum. So what they do is they feed a fiber optic cables through each of these holes, which then pick up the image of whatever that object is. So using this technique, they can get the spectrum of about a thousand objects at a time, and they can typically go through 10 or 12 or 13 of these disks in a night. So using this technique, they've now gotten the spectra of over 3 million individual objects in space. 500 on that. Plate. You can, you counted 500? Well, they do them in groups of 10, so I just counted the 10s. Ah, okay, very good. <laughs> And then the larger telescope, the three and a half meter telescope. So this is the housing for the telescope. This is ISMAR again. And this is the tube that's standing in front of the telescope. Um, you're not looking at the mirror because it's a dust cover which is present. Right now we're seeing the dust cover being uh, opened up. And there is the mirror. Here's the object that we're looking at that night. This is the moon uh, <clears throat> in the first quarter. <coughs> and this is not a picture we took, but this was taken at another time <clears throat> from that site during a total eclipse of the moon. And you can easily see the laser beam going <clears throat> from the telescope up to the moon. And it looks like it's going, I think this is the Sea of Serenity. That's where it's directed to that particular end. The picture was taken. We stayed until dark. She actually, the, the astronomer Russ McMillan, actually started taking data before dark. But when we left in the dark, we could stand outside the observatory and we could see the green beam going right up to the moon. Do they have? Do they watch for airplanes? Or yes, they do. They have two observers which are out looking for airplanes, and if they see any airplanes in the area, then they they shut down until the airplanes have left. see telescope, you occasionally find other interesting things in the area. And that was the case here. This is a Trinity site where they tested the first atomic bomb. And it's in New Mexico, uh, not too far from Alamogordo. And this site is now a National Historic Site. It's open to the public just two days per year, usually the first Saturday of either April or October. Uh, the year we went, in fact, it was only open once that year to the public. But we, we scheduled our visit to the telescope so that we can get in and see this site as well. Trinity site. So we had to walk down about half a mile from the parking lot. And <clears throat> this is a monument at ground zero. The bomb was detonated at the top of a tower about 100 feet high. And this was directly below the bomb. The bomb left a crater about five feet deep. 30 feet in radius, and they have since uh, got the bulldozers in and leveled it off again. It is a little radioactive. The background there is about 10 times the background uh, and surrounding areas. We were there for about an hour and a half, but according to my calculation, the radiation dose we got in that hour and a half was less than the radiation dose we got on the flight out there. <laughs> also in the same areas, white sands. National Monument. There's more than 100 square miles of this white sand. This is finely powdered gypsum. <coughs> washes down from the surrounding hills. And here, here's Ismar getting a picture of a couple ladies who posed for us. And that is the end of my first half. Okay, Dale, are you available to it was going to be a one minute or two minute intermission. <clears throat> we'll 
switch to the second half of the talk. Are there any questions at the moment while we're making the transition? What is that? I have no idea what that is. <laughs> is that the tower? Jerry, how That's not my picture. Yeah, yes, Jerry. What means do they use to point the laser at the proper location on the moon? <clears throat> uh, they got the coordinates very precisely. They've been entered into a computer. The computer controls the telescope. And then the astronomer looking at the view on the camera, which is looking through the telescope, does some fine tuning to get it right exactly on the mirror. And she knows she's on the mirror when we start getting uh, yeah, photons yeah. coming back. Yeah, I got you. Okay, good. Because actually pointing it at, yeah. at the exact target without mm -hmm. a feedback. Yeah, it's feedback. very difficult. I forget the exact dimension, <laughs> but I think the beam leaves the telescope three and a half meters in diameter. Uh -huh. And when it gets to the moon, it's, it's like uh, one or two kilometers in diameter. Uh -huh. So, so they, they, okay, so they, they move it around a little bit and they go <laughs> at, at the mirror, but not that much. Yes. Yeah, this, <clears throat> the FFA, FAA. Um, alert, you know, planes that this is going to be going uh, yes, I th yes, I think the FAA does alert you. But that, that doesn't keep them all away. Okay. That's good. Okay, let me, let me go on to the second part of the talk, which is my trip up to the geographic North Pole. Uh, this was done in a nuclear-powered Russian icebreaker, and it was done uh, back in July of 2014. The icebreaker, um, the name is 50 Years of Victory. It is the world's largest nuclear-powered icebreaker. We started in Murmansk, Russia, and we had an intermediate stop at Franz Josef Land, <coughs> which is an archipelago of, of quite a few islands located at about 80 degrees uh, north latitude. Let me give credit to John Ho um, from Hong Kong. I'm using some of his pictures and movies. For this presentation, since he had a very high quality camera. <laughs> so, uh, the expedition was arranged by Quark Expedition, the U.S. company, but they make arrangements with Russia each year. They make use of the <coughs> icebreaker um, when it's not being used in Russia for clearing, clearing the waterways. So, I flew uh, from Detroit to Helsinki, Finland, right here. And then the next morning, we took a charter flight up to Murmansk, Russia. And then from there, we went up through um, Franz Joseph Land, dropped off a team of biologists. I think we had about maybe <coughs> six or eight biologists who were going to be staying for, for a few weeks, studying the bird life. And then we continued on to the North Pole, turned around, turned around, came back through Franz Joseph Land, and then we were let off in three different islands, but we could walk around <coughs> a little bit. And then back to Murmansk. What was the temperature like in Franz Joseph Land? <clears throat> the temperature uh, was quite warm. It was about uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. It wasn't at all. And this was in the middle of the summer. Okay. It wasn't particularly cold. You'd wear a jacket, but you don't need any really heavy. Okay. Everything. So, uh, this is Helsinki. Um, I'd never been in Finland before, and so I had a few hours, so I walked around and took just a few pictures. Helsinki has a population of about 1.4 million, and it is the northernmost city, which has a metro population of a million or more. So just a few quick pictures of Helsinki. <coughs> this is the Hilton Hotel. I have a staying about that room. A lot of waterways there. Helsinki is the capital, largest city in Finland. One of the cathedrals there. People relaxing in a park. And they have a number of nice gardens there as well. So here we are at the Helsinki airport. And we're going to get on our 11 o'clock departure for our flight to Murmansk. And so we're flying out. I took this picture out of the window. This is Helsinki Airport. And we flew for about two hours, and just as we're coming down, ready to land in Murmansk, I took this picture out of the window of the plane. And here we are at the airport. And then we were driven through the city. We had about three hours to kill before 
Uh, the boat was ready for us, and so we were taking a little tour of the city. It has a population of about 300,000 people. It's, a, it's uh, the largest city north of the Arctic Circle. Even an ad for an Audi. You can buy Audis there. Uh, we stopped for a quick tour of one of the churches. Interior of the church. We also take it to a memorial to the heroic Soviet soldiers that defended the motherland during the Second World War. They have a statue there about 150 feet high. Then we're taken out to the base where the nuclear powered icebreaker was. So they wouldn't let us take pictures on the base because it was a military base. But this is, this is what the icebreaker looks like, and this was on another trip up to the North Pole. 50 years of victory, world's largest nuclear icebreaker. A little bit of information about it. It was commissioned back in 2007. Overall length is a little more than 500 feet. Displacement almost 26,000 tons. It's propelled by three fixed pitch propellers, and the, the horsepower is 75,000 for pushing it through the ice. The power source is not one, but two nuclear reactors, uh, each of which puts out 171 megawatts. And in open waters, its top speed is uh, 21 knots, registered, of course, in Russia. So <clears throat> here we are leaving the dock. tugboats pulling us out. You notice uh, we have a helicopter on board. <clears throat> and as we go out, we see a number of other nuclear-powered icebreakers. This is one. You can, anytime you see an atom, the symbol of an atom, that means it's nuclear-powered right there. Another nuclear-powered vessel. This is a floating dry dock. One of the nuclear reactors is right under this very heavy, about a uh, foot and a half thick uh, steel plate, firmly bolted in place. Are those all orange bolts on the side of those light bolts? <clears throat> what was that? The orange bolts on the side of the ship, are those, are those the light bolts? Light bolts, yeah, yeah, we had light bolts. Let me see if I can go backwards there. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, th yeah, this is, uh, yeah, we had the four light bolts. Do you have any drills? We did have a drill. Yes, we did. That was um, required. We all had to be, be present for the drill. Well, now we're uh, <clears throat> leaving the land behind, heading out. This is looking back over the stern. This is the bridge. It was open most of the time for us to go up, pretty much any time we wanted, except when certain critical maneuvers are taking place. Uh, as we're out in the open waters, uh, we're going, this is the compass, in the bridge, we're not going exactly north, but we were going uh, north-northeast, about uh, 22 degrees, because we're heading, first of all, to Franz Joseph Land. Oops. So we had about two days of just open water. So this was a view looking um, from the bow. We always had birds that were circling around us. This is the view from the stern. And after a couple days, we saw our first iceberg, which means that we're getting close to the land, to Franz Joseph land. And this is what it looks like off in the distance a few miles away. Getting close. This is the island to which the biologists went for their study of bird life. And um, there were several biologists, and they also had guys, as you can see right here, he has a high-powered rifle. This guy is carrying a high-powered rifle. Uh, they went with uh, either two or three people with rifles for protection from the polar bears. The polar bears have no fear of man. Polar bears are almost always hungry. Polar bears consider, anytime they encounter humans, food. They will very often come after them. 
uh, this one for protection. Did you see any? Oh, yes, we did say. I'll show you a picture of one. Oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 just a minute here. Yes, we did. We saw, we probably saw about half a dozen polar bears uh, on our trip. Uh, so uh, they went to that island both by uh, Zodiac uh, craft, inflatable boats, and also by helicopters. So here they're loading the helicopter. Helicopter's taking off. And there goes the helicopter towards the island. Uh, we encountered these uh, creatures on nearby. You recognize as walruses. We encountered one very belligerent walrus who came out after the zodiac. Okay, he made a lot of noise and he was very unhappy. And uh, the fear was that he would puncture. So this is inflatable with his tusks. Uh, so he was able to get away before that happened, but he was not a happy walrus. There he, so he's swimming around making a lot of noise. Okay, so now uh, we're on our way north again towards the pole. <coughs> From time to time we encounter gaps in the ice, which are called leads. The ice cap is not a solid um, ice cap, but in fact is plates, which move around relative to each other <coughs> as the wind blows. And any time a lead like this opens up, which is pointing more or less north, uh, the boat would take it because it could travel much faster there than through the ice itself. Uh, here's some tracks. These are polar bear tracks. And we, in fact, came up on the polar bear. He, in fact, had just caught a seal <coughs> and is um, consuming the seal. And it's a very brave or foolish um, seagull right here who's wanting to get in and get a bite. I'll stand away from the polar bear. Polar bear was quite nervous with, with this big boat nearby. We were probably about 50, 50 meters away from the boat, from the bear. And so eventually he got tired of eating and, and left. This is something I've never seen before. This is an atmospheric phenomenon. It's called a fog bow. It's produced in the same way that a rainbow is produced in the rain, except instead of droplets of water, this is produced by the very fine mist that makes up the fog. Uh, in this case, the particles of water are like a thousandth of an inch in diameter. And because of the very small size of the water particles, there's a lot of diffraction which takes place, which tends to wipe out the, the spread of colors that you normally see in a rainbow. So this is pretty much just white for fog bow. So we uh, continue north. These are the chunks of ice that we're breaking up as we go through. The ice typically is about two meters in thickness, about six feet. So two to three meters in thickness, six to ten feet in thickness. The boat can go through two meters with no problem. When it encounters three meters, it slows it down quite a bit. And on occasion, we'll even stop the boat. <coughs> the boat is stopped, it simply backs up a quarter mile or so, and then goes charging full speed ahead. And whatever was um, stopping it, then it goes right through it. So they took us for rides on the helicopter. We got to go up three times on the trip. So now we're up in one of the helicopters looking down at our boat. Jerry, the sign was in English. Though. Were most of the passengers there? English? We had a wide variety of passengers. I was expecting most would be from the U.S. I see. That was not the case. We, we, we have quite a few from the U.S., but we probably had more from the Orient. Quite a few Japanese, uh, some Chinese, um, Europeans, Australians, people from all over the globe. <clears throat> the Japanese had their own interpreter. And uh, when presentations were made in English, uh, the interpreter would then be translated into Japanese for the Japanese guests. So, uh, I had originally reserved uh, a cabin, uh, a single cabin, one room, and uh, they very nicely gave me a free upgrade, a $65,000 upgrade, to a four-room suite, which was quite nice. Um, and in, in the suite we had a, a display, a GPS display of where we were, and so this is reading 89 degrees north, 55 minutes. 
So we are essentially five nautical miles from the North Pole at this time. And that's when I left my room and went up uh, to the bow of the boat to, to celebrate our arrival at the North Pole. So this is what it looks like at the North Pole looking south. What other direction can you look? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. And this is looking south in another direction. <laughs> And this is looking south in the direction from which the boat has come. So you can see the ice has been broken up as we, we pass through it. Uh, a lot of people got flags out and poles, a lot of champagne. We were all given champagne to celebrate. Notice everybody is wearing a, a yellow, we were all given the itching yellow parkas. Um, we didn't really need them. The temperature at the North Pole was about in zero, well, about 32 Fahrenheit, um, or maybe one degree, I'm sorry, 33 degrees Fahrenheit. So here's a bunch of happy people, they're up on the top of the world, celebrating. And we all got together at the bow and had our picture taken from the bridge. So I'm, I, I'm down in here somewhere. I don't remember where, and I <laughs> haven't looked at anybody to find where I am. But. Now, are you okay. right at the pole now, or yes, five, we are. five miles from it? No, no, that's at the pole. That's at the pole. We're, we're sitting on top of the North Pole. And uh, this is what the ship looks like. Um, after, and you see there's a lot of tracks, because we got out and we had a big party. So and they got out the barbecue equipment and the tables up, and we had an excellent meal. And of course, got the hot air balloon out to celebrate. We all went on hot air balloon rides <laughs> up at the North Pole. But the balloon was tethered, so it wouldn't blow away. So we, we would go up about probably 300 feet out of it, about 300 feet high, I would estimate. <laughs> this is Annie. This is the wife of, of John. John Hoa took this picture. He seems it's very strong. So they brought a small and a full size balloon. That's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. And then we all posed around the North Pole. So here's a sign indicating the North Pole. And we're all right around it. Uh, we also found a sign there at the North Pole giving uh, directions and distances to various places. So uh, Cape Town is 13,000 kilometers away. Mumbai is almost 8,000 kilometers away. Reykjavik, 2,900 kilometers. Uh, Honolulu, 75, 32 kilometers. Uh, equator, exactly 10,000 kilometers. The reason it's exactly 10,000 kilometers is because in the original definition of the meter, it was defined to be such that 10 million meters right. would take you from the North Pole to the equator. Is that sign permanent? Apparently, no, I don't think so. I think they planted it there. But uh, there it is. Were there very many other tour ships up that way? No, 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 there's nobody else. That uh, was that. We found a phone booth. <laughs> and we were given uh, three minutes. We could call anybody in the world on a satellite phone and give them greetings from the North Pole. I have a friend, Al Varone, <clears throat> maybe some of you know him. He used to teach uh, physics and astronomy at OCC. Uh, I called him at 3 in the morning, but I didn't wake him up. Didn't. I left a message. Now this guy has noticed that the boat's a little bit shorter than our pole, so he's trying to pull it forward just a uh, few more meters. He did, he did not succeed. We had some, we had crazy, some crazy people on board. They, they had what was called the polar plunge. And I, I found that most of the passengers were in fact crazy because about two-thirds of them jumped in the water. <laughs> water temperature, minus 1.6 Celsius. So what is that? It's about 3 degrees Fahrenheit below freezing. So that would be about uh, 29 degrees Fahrenheit, that water is. Most people would jump in and scream and then paddle out very fast. And they got a line attached. So if you have a heart attack or pass out or something, they pull you back in. <laughs> okay, yes, I did not. I did not participate in that event. So now we're back in Franz Joseph Land, and uh, this is one of the islands on which we landed. 
before we got out, um, we had four guys with high-powered rifles. Instead of a rectangular area, and the guys with the rifle were at the corners. We had to stay within the rectangle. We also had a helicopter overhead looking for polar bears. And fortunately, we did not encounter any polar bears on any of the islands. This is John Ho, who took uh, some of the pictures I'm showing with this camera. And this is a professor from the University of Wisconsin, professor of geology and meteorology, who gave some of the lectures on board. Uh, we saw several whales. This is one of the other islands on which we landed. <clears throat> Rather barren, but there was uh, some primitive um, plant life there, a few flower plants. And this is the proof I was there. Uh, this is John Hall, this is me, this is the professor, and this is John's wife, Annie. Okay, um, I'll just mention quickly that concludes my uh, trip to the pole, that Ismar and I took another trip just, just in the last month. And this was a trip to the east. It included uh, visiting the Allegheny Observatory, which is in Pittsburgh, the Green Bank Radial Telescope, which is uh, located uh, in Green Bank, West Virginia. Uh, we went to the National Air and Space Museums in Washington, D.C., and out near Dulles International Airport. Uh, we got a tour of the U.S. Naval Observatory uh, in Washington, and we also visited the, the Goddard Space Flight Center, where they're now constructing the uh, next space telescope to go up, the James Webb Space Telescope, which will be replacing the Hubble Space Telescope. We got a private tour <clears throat> inside, and this is the Ismar and I standing at the windows looking into the giant clean room in which they are now assembling the James Webb Space Telescope. There it is. This is a framework in which they're now mounting mirrors and electronics and so forth. It's scheduled for launch in October 2018. So again, the framework. Uh, very delightful young lady, uh, Maggie. Maggie uh, <clears throat> took us on a tour. She was very generous, gave us three hours, and took us around and showed us lots of interesting things. I got one more trip scheduled coming up. This is, uh, I have not yet gone to the South Pole, but I will be soon. In December 29th, I'm flying down to the South Pole. So this is the NSF research site at the uh, Geographical South Pole. A couple telescopes I hope to visit. One is called Ice Cube, which is a giant neutrino detector. It's a cubic kilometer of ice, which is filled with thousands of neutrino detectors and uh, it's looking for neutrinos coming from, from all over. Oops. Uh, there's uh, one other telescope called the South Pole Telescope, which looks um, in, in the millimeter wave band, and is looking at the cosmic background radiation, looking at the anisotropy, uh, spatial anisotropy, looking at uh, the polarization, and, and so forth. So that's where I hope to be going in uh, a couple months. Okay. <laughs> Includes my slides. Have we got any time left? I got a couple movies I could show, if uh, there is time for that. Dale, can we get your help again? Uh, maybe one movie. One movie. Okay, we'll give you one movie. What was the total time in the boat? Mm. Uh, about a week there. A week back. About two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you can find. Uh, I'll, sh I'll give you a. I'll show you a movie of uh, actually going through the ice. Food yeah, these are short. These are a couple minutes. Hey, Jerry. Yes. What, what do we say to get the sixty-five thousand dollar upgrade from free? <laughs> <laughs> I, the gal guy I was dealing with, I sent him some, some very nice pictures of the aurora borealis, as seen from White Horse Yukon, and he liked them. I guess that's why he. So astro photos, okay? Astro <laughs> photos, that's right. I mean, yeah. How was the food on the ship? Food was excellent. We, yeah, yeah, we, we have, we have yeah, very good. You cut good out the buffet slides. What's that? You cut out the buffet slides. <laughs> I did, yeah, yeah. Well, that was the Antarctic. Okay, let, 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 me, uh, let me get one movie for you. Oops, sorry. Let's uh, do this. You have sound? Uh, I don't know. We will, okay, we'll find out. Before you do anything, wait, wait, wait. Oh, hang on. Okay, okay anyway, we're going through the ice here. Not this, um, 
your speaker. Yeah, but I've got the sound turned off. Ah, now okay. I can't get at it. Okay, so this is what it looks like uh, going along. We're probably doing 10, 12 knots through the ice. Are you plowing through one of those gaps that you were talking about? No, right here we're going through solid ice. Okay. So we're breaking up the ice as we go through it. And uh, if you look, there's a patch coming up which is nice and flat. And watch what happens to it as we go by the edge of it. Cool. How thick is that ice? That, that ice is typically six feet thick. And we're doing 10, 12 knots. Was that real loud? Uh, well, we had that. Not real loud, no, but uh, you can definitely hear it as we're crunching through the ice. Must be a few horsepower behind that. Well, 75,000 horsepower. <laughs> Jerry, did you catch any auroras while you were up there? <clears throat> we were there in the summer, and the sun never set. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it was, it, the sun was up all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, well, that, that's probably enough of that, and I think my time is up. So thank you, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> we probably have time for a couple of questions. If somebody has something. <laughs> When you were in Murmansk, uh, did you have to have a Soviet official accompanying you wherever you went, or was it no. like the old Soviet days? No, no, but we didn't have much time in Murmansk. Uh, we were met at the airport, put on a bus, driven around. We got off of the bus from time to time. We could walk around freely where we were, but uh, no, there was no, we had nobody. Yeah, now they wouldn't let you take pictures of the... Uh, we could not take pictures of the military base okay. where, where the icebreaker... Uh, was situated when we arrived. In one of your pictures, a uh, Soviet aircraft carrier. There's no Soviet. Russian. Any, 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 any. Russian. Russian. Yeah. Mm, thank you, Brad. Thank you. Thank you. 50, 50 years of yes, victory. Uh, that looked like there was approximately 100 or 150 people, uh, uh, I guess, on the... Yeah, yeah, something like that. In that ballpark, 100, 150. I don't remember the exact number. I think it was over 100. Was that the capacity of the... No, no, there were there were spare rooms. That's why you got your upgrade. That's why I got the free upgrade. Because, yeah, it was available. Uh, Might have asked what that trip set you back. Right. Yeah, that was um, it was twenty five thousand dollars per person if you have two people in a cabin. I I it was only me in the cabin. Well, they, they, they charged fifty percent more. So thirty seven thousand for for that plus, plus airfare. Up to Jerry, just to refresh my memory, do, yeah. do you know the conversion between miles and knots? I know it's very close. But well, there is no conversion because miles is distance and knots is speed. But a knot is one nautical mile per hour, okay. which is about uh, 1.15 miles per statue miles per hour. 1.15 okay. statue miles per hour. That's pretty close. <laughs> well, um, Tonight, uh, as usual, after a meeting here at Macomb, uh, a number of us uh, go to a Coney Island restaurant. It's on Van Dyke, just north of 12 Mile Road. For those who are interested, you're welcome to, uh, to do that. And let's thank our speaker again. <laughs>